Hello, Guilty Feminist, and welcome to the latest of our special Culture Club episodes. This time we're looking at the Apple TV Plus series, Manhunt. Now, on the Guilty Feminist, we don't normally focus on anything that starts with man, but... There's a really good reason for doing this. In April 1865, John Wilkes Booth assassinated President Abraham Lincoln quite famously during a performance of a play, and that play was called Our American Cousin, and it was at Ford's Theatre in Washington, D.C. Booth fled the scene of the crime, and this new miniseries follows Secretary of War Edwin Stanton as he tries to track Booth down. I am thrilled to be joined today by showrunner and creator Monica Boletsky and one of the stars of the show, Lovey Simone, who plays Mary Sims, a young woman who testified at Booth's trial and whose story intersects with his in various ways. And speaking of intersectionality, uh, this show is far more about intersectional feminist concerns than one would think, as is this story. Um, We think of it as a very man-based story, but really there's so much at stake here about the way people lived then and the way we live now. And you can draw a direct line uh, through Monica Boletsky's brilliant take on what happened. Monica and Lovey, welcome to The Guilty Feminist. Very happy to be here. (laughs) It's a delight to have you both. Um, So, Monica, can I ask you at first, how did you first become interested in the Stanton Booth story? I first became interested when I came across a story that the Lincoln assassination was not just an attack on him that night, that there were other attacks, which I had never, ever heard of before. And that story always stuck with me wondering, well, why why aren't we taught that it was there were multiple attacks that night, mm. you know, why, what a strange thing to leave out of our sort of collective conscious. So that stayed with me. And then um, when I came across Edwin Stanton, who was Lincoln's secretary of war, um, I found it absolutely fascinating that essentially for about 12 hours between the shooting and uh, when the next president Johnson was sworn in, we really had no conscious American president. Mm -hmm. And so Stanton was essentially de facto president for 12 hours, but I had never heard of him before. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was such a dramatic situation to fall on someone, to lose someone that they were really close to working side by side intensely on a, on a war, um, who became really good friends and then the guilt that he must've felt. So that, that all just sort of, to me seemed, uh, really, exciting. And then also whenever I'm looking for a lead role in a story, it's always great when they have a workplace, you know, drama and they have a family drama and they have personal drama. Um, And Stanton had asthma at a time before there were inhalers um, and medicine for that. And I have a loved one who's, who has asthma and has been in the hospital for it. So it was interesting to me and and really appealed to me to tell a story about someone who really couldn't get help for that while they're fighting this civil rights battle. Mm, Very, very interesting. Just so many really juicy things for a writer when you see that in the story and you think, yeah, how can I draw these lines together? And I, I think one of the really interesting things that you've done is you've looked at the role of Mary Sims and... Uh, Lovey, you play Mary Sims. Could you tell us a little bit about her and why you wanted to play her? Well, Mary Sims plays one of the people that were testifying um, during the trial against um, the Confederacy. And I wanted to play her because as a Black woman, I do know that a lot of my history hasn't been told or hasn't been um, dived into because of a lack of accountability. Um, on, you know, the U.S. government side. So I did want to kind of just, you know, pay a little homage to that time period and that kind of place that didn't have a lot of like light on it and awareness of it. And I also was very intrigued with the fact that Mary was testifying against like her previous slave owner, which was like a very heroic act in that time because of just, you know, the oppression, not just like verbally and mentally, but physically. So just to see how a girl can, a girl, a woman can, you know, 
get through these like mental trials and tribulations and to kind of gain that courage and to want to see the truth and want justice. Yes. Of course, we think of Lincoln and we think of the assassination, but we don't realize how much of it was about enslavement and about the direct line that you can draw to Mm -hmm. violence in America now and the you know, uprisings that you can have in America now, Mm -hmm. like, for example, the the uprising at the Capitol building. Monica, can you speak to that a little bit about uh, why you think Lincoln's assassination draws a direct parallel to gun violence in America today? Um, I definitely felt the relevance as I was reading about the story, as I was working on it. It really struck me you know, in recent times, it's become sort of a party joke, like, oh, well, but what did you think of the play, Mrs. Lincoln? You know, but the truth is, it's a it's a, such a tragic situation. And the fact that they were in a theater, one of their first, you know, times out in, in years, really having a date night, where they could sort of let their guard down, the war had, uh, Lee had just surrendered five days before, which was something else I didn't know. And so they were deciding to have some joy and go see a comedy of all things in a theater, which is a place where you're supposed to feel safe. Right. And, you know, the fact that he was so cruelly cut down from the back, you know, didn't have a chance to fight for himself or anything in a place where we're supposed to, as a society, be able to feel, you know, that we can be together um, comfortably and safely That really haunted me. And the fact that Booth did it five days after Lee surrendered, I had never seen a connection between the outcome of the war and uh, Booth assassinating Lincoln. I thought it was much later. And so it was hard not to see it as a direct response from someone who could not accept the result of the war. Mm. And so the fact that it seemed like it was steeped in white supremacy, that act, did echo what we've seen happening sometimes today. Mm. And your character, I think, brings that out more than anybody's lovey. I felt Mary's defiance, her stillness, her dignity, and also her fear and her vulnerability because she is working in a house where white men are constantly threatening her and there's always this promise of violence. There's an incredible scene where your character is told to shave John Wilkes Booth, who's fled Mm -hmm. the scene of the assassination. He is hiding out there because he's hurt his leg and he can't just travel on. And the doctor, who's in a very archaic way, just set his leg, i.e. just twisted around, he's screamed out pain and then he's put a splint on it. It's quite archaic. He's saying to you, well, you have to look after this man. And Mm -hmm. at this point, you don't know who he is. Uh, You don't know that he's killed the president. Um, Mm -hmm. And there's a scene where you're shaving him, you're told to shave him. And can you you talk about that scene a little bit? Because it was so latent and so laced and so dramatic and it was absolutely brilliant. First of all, that scene was um, probably one of my favorite to shoot just because I feel like even though there weren't uh, many words in the scene, it didn't have to have words. Just like I feel like um, if we just watched the first episode, we wouldn't have to have any dialogue in between any of the characters. You would just know kind of what energy is kind of being harbored between like the two people. So with Mary and um, and John Wilkes Booth and like his um, I I, I feel like all of his thoughts about like, you know, his paranoia and like him being caught in like her world of like being so like just not aware of anything outside of that house. So it was like this big world came into this really, really tiny, tiny, small world. Mm. And so it felt like it. And so for me, it was just a lot of processing. And it was also different to process it as Mary, because Mary isn't as educated. She didn't go to school or have proper schooling like today's day and age. So it was just a lot of like, Well, what does it look like if, you know, you got a lot of information all at once and maybe it might be scary. Maybe it might be like it could kill you, but whoa, what's happening? So it was just 
a lot of feeling and processing and having to like go through all of these emotions. And then I can only imagine what Anthony was going through on his side too. But yeah, just like that big world coming in Mm -hmm. to this small world for the first time ever. It was really, it made it fun. Oh, it was an extraordinary scene because of course with the old fashioned razor, you're having to sort of sharpen the razor on a leather strap and all there's all this mm-hmm. latent violence and then you're you know you could slit his throat uh it's a yeah. it's it feels but the power is the other way of course mm-hmm. you're terrified he's going to turn the knife on you and it's it's yeah it's really something that scene and i i loved the use of flashback to see your character's childhood as mm-hmm. all the trauma in the childhood of mary who was at one point the family had escaped enslavement and they'd gone to a free state and Mm -hmm. the enslavers came and rode there and said, you're our property and we can take you back. And at one point she's kidnapped Mm -hmm. and she's only a little tiny girl and it's terrifying. And Yeah. It's very watchable though. It's not like a lot of times I can't watch stuff like that. I turn away, but the way it's shot Mm -hmm. and the way it's, it's, it feels like we're communing on something rather than there's no trauma porn feel to it for me. It feels yeah. like it just makes you realize the day that the the Civil War was won, mm-hmm. you're still, in many cases, working for someone who used to enslave you. What's the line? What's the difference? You know that it's not like the next day everything's great. It's like you're still having to yeah. live with these people, <laughs> and that yeah. really came home in this. I thought it was. In- I really appreciate you noticing that because that was something I hadn't really seen much before of people living just after emancipation or, Mm -hmm. you know, essentially their lives, you know, maybe she's making a dime a week or something, you know, but essentially their lives are not that different. Mm -hmm. And that really uh, struck me as an opportunity for us to sort of show the connection between that and the loss of reconstruction in the Lincoln assassination and how in a lot of ways we're still kind of catching up and trying to, you know, make things more equal today because there there just wasn't institutional structures for helping freed people get on their feet. So that really appealed to me. And also, I think the tension that Lovey and, and Anthony played, Anthony hated being mean to her, <laughs> um, but they played the tension so well. And I fictionalized the part about Lovey's, uh, sorry, about Mary Sims' childhood, um, but it is a true uh, story that happened in Pennsylvania in a town called Christiana, where the white residents and the black residents uh, stood up against slave owners who had come to retrieve enslaved people who they had owned um, and tried to bring them back. And the town rose up. And when I was researching that, I came across one of the men who they were trying to take back. Last name was Sims, just like oh Mary. Oh my Sims. God. In the, yeah. And so I thought I had enough creative license to say, Hey, you know, this could have mm-hmm. been her uncle. Um, and I thought that story was really moving. And because Mary Sims is just a footnote in the trial, we know almost nothing about her except her age, what she says in the trial, and her, that her brothers uh, also testified. Um, I really had to work backwards and figure out, well, how did she get from working f- for Dr. Mudd to being this courageous, unsung American hero in this trial? So. I had to really just invent that and try to make it as plausible as possible. And so that was the backstory I gave her because it it was in the realm of possible. You've done an amazing job. Have you seen The Crown and the license that Peter Morgan takes when those uh, people are still alive? Those people are still alive. <laughs> um, he's just like, I don't know, that happened and that happened. Let's draw a great big heavy line between them. Have you watched any Oliver Stone? It's like, I don't know, it could have happened. Um, let's pretend it was gospel. I know, I love that. And I love, you know, as a, as a, I'm researching something historical myself to fictionalise, and it's so exciting when you find like a name like that and you go, oh, my God, it, this could be the same family or whatever. It's the most thrilling thing because you're trying to make it as true as possible. But sometimes... You know, in order to tell the truth, you need to change the facts because the truth of it is the feeling, the engagement, the fight of the people. And you don't want to be too in servitude to the facts. And I will say that's just for historical dramas, not for the news, guys. Um, 
But I... Right, yeah. Because you know, two historical things that happened that both are truthful and impactful, you put them together because you can't, you know, tell every single story, but you can layer one on top of the other. But I, I loved all that backstory and I just loved the understanding of how you had, you still had to keep on living near those people with those people. In many cases, the only work you had was for those, with, with those people. And their attitudes hadn't changed just because they'd lost the war. And I think that that is played out so well. Do you know anything more about Mary Sims Lovey or did you have to create that through other research and intuition? And how did you play that? I didn't have much, um, knowledge on Mary Sims as an individual, but as a black girl in like who lives in that kind of collective, I would say like certain things, um, just feel like, right. You know, like Mm -hmm. certain responses or certain things just feel right just because of how they evolved and how they look on me. So a lot of my actions were like, okay, now if I didn't have that much freedom to show that much anger and to be that human, what would that look like? Or what does, you know, like how to reason with that. So a lot of, um, the, the shame of going back to mud and, um, the the just like all of the ego the ego parts of like her that have been suppressed by her environment it was just kind of tapping into that more so and tapping into um just the reactions kind of based off of what um the actor that was playing mud was giving me in a lot of our scenes it was just like a lot of quick oh but oh you know like uh, mm-hmm. trying to push trying to explode but push the explosion down right away (laughs) you know Mm. because I do feel like slaves did have a lot of humanity that um you know we're just not taught about we're not told about um so they did have feelings they did have you know they hated things they loved things they were envious of things so just kind of trying to keep that in there with Mary like so moments where you know certain things that would you know get somebody like you know kind of pissed off I would you know just to not fully throw that away because I know that oppression was, you know, the erasure of that humanity, but kind of trying to bring it back in the story and bring the relevance back to it. Mm. There's an amazing scene where the the man you're working for takes your book away and Mm -hmm. it's a moment where she does stand up to him and she is saying, please don't, but this is such a precious thing for her. And that he's just going to snatch yeah. one of the very few things she has, and I I don't know yet why why it's so important, except for the obvious reasons. But it, I figure it might be more important down the line, and as I get into the series. Mm-hmm. But it's a really wonderful moment between you and and uh, the other your character and the other character, Monica. You you must have poured a lot of yourself into it too, as a biracial Black American woman. How much did you draw on your family history? It feels so deep. And and also you did African-American studies at Harvard. This is your specialty as well. It feels very alive and it feels very real. It feels very human. People are witty. They're funny. They feel real. They feel contemporary in the best possible way, uh, as well as honoring the historical period. How much were you able to do that and not make it a sort of stilted historical piece, as we often see, like people in the past aren't real people. They're just walking around saying old fashioned stuff. How much were you able to make it? Being serious and miserable. Yeah, being serious and miserable. <laughs> how were you how how, you, how much was the this your heritage playing into it and how much your education at Harvard really deep diving into African American history? How did you bring all that to life? Did it play in? Yeah, absolutely. I think just going back to something else you said before, it was really important to me not to contribute more to trauma porn. And so I really tried to be very mindful as I was writing the scenes with Lovey so that nothing was gratuitous and that nothing was uh, so unbearable. And so I adopted a sort of um, Hitchcock take on it. So when there's a scene of brutality, it's behind a closed door. And when we're doing the backstory of her childhood in the episode that you saw, I really needed that to show the stakes and to show the context of her position in society so people would understand why why would she, why wouldn't she just go to the cops you know um and so that was really important so it was a tricky balance between um you know not wanting to exploit the situation emotionally and to be really truthful 
And I tried to do it in a way that I haven't seen before. But to answer your other question, I would say that I did my genealogy and I didn't know my father's extended family very well growing up. And I I do think part of my writing is sort of um, having the chance to learn about my culture, learn about people who I don't necessarily get to know in life because they passed away or they are estranged or for whatever reason. And so it's been kind of a lifelong thing for me of of reading and researching and immersing myself in African American history as a way to sort of understand the context of how I'm here and who I am. And one of the things I discovered is that my grandmother's family for at least five generations were uh, enslaved on a plantation only 30 minutes from where we ended up filming, which was just such a strange, Mm -hmm. um, you know, coincidence. And my, and my grandmother's grandmother, Flora, she uh, was the first woman on that side of my family who was born in slavery, but then became free during her lifetime. And she moved to Savannah where we filmed when she was free. And that was such an inspiration for me as we were filming there to go, you know, grandmother's grandmother generation to me running this giant massive show in the city where you know she's walking down streets probably that look exactly the same as what I'm walking down it was very moving to me and the opportunity that I have wasn't lost on me wow I mean that's absolutely chilling and also what a powerful thing that you know, not that many generations later, you are running a show, you know, that is the biggest one finger up to the power I've ever heard. I think it's just, you know, it actually makes me feel like crying because it's just, you know, the fact (laughs) it's really, yeah, it's, it's really, really moving because, you know, to, to that's, that's a, that's a fight in the family. And how much, how, I mean, I just also so beautiful that you, you, two extraordinary women got to work together and tell this story because normally something like Lincoln and men riding horses, sorry, we're all falling apart a bit here now. Um, There's just (laughs) issues all over the zip. Um, But that, you know, and Monica and I have been friends for a long time, so we've seen each other through the the good times, the bad times. This is a very big day for me to be able to talk to her about this. And um, I actually remember you sent me a picture when you were a location scouting of somewhere that your family had been forced to live. And it was just the most chilling thing for me, but also what a power to like, be like, guess what? Now I'm getting to tell the story. It's that last song in Hamilton where she says, who lives, who dies, who tells your story. And it's, it's to grasp the reins of the story changes everything. That is what was so moving about getting to write Mary Sims and work with Lovey is that part of what I'm trying to do with that role is to show that something that you've said to me over the years, which is someone like Mary Sims in a different context, she could have been a Supreme Court justice. She could have been, you know, a civil rights lawyer. She could have been anything, Mm -hmm. but she just didn't have that opportunity And so one thing that was really important to me, and you'll see as the show continues, is Lovey and I really show her potential Mm -hmm. and what she does with uh, the opportunity she has. When we were in Savannah, another thing that was a real, uh, you know, needing a tissue box was uh, there were these forts there that they had built during the Civil War. And when I was going on the tour, because we ended up using it as a location for a bunch of things. I was told that the bricks, all the bricks in the fort were made by enslaved people and that it was actually sort of like an opportunity for them to do something besides, you know, the farm work and the and the hard labor of that was to make these bricks for, you know, to be a part of the war. And this was when they weren't soldiers. The African-American men weren't able to be soldiers yet. And you you go there and you can see sometimes people have put their initials in the oh bricks. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, for some people, if it could have been me, it could have been someone in my family, their only opportunity in life to put their name on something was a brick. And to see that to what what Mary Sims got to do, which, you know, 
uh, it was only legal in the States for black people to testify in court a couple years before this takes place. So there were only, we don't know, but only a few people had testified in court before her. So she's one of the very first black people to be able to have the right to be a witness in court. And that compared to, you know, putting your name on a brick Mm -hmm. in the time is so huge. And so to be able to tell that story and then show how amazing she is at the trial and and what her potential was, that that was part of the point of the story for me was to just remind us that these people were all people with potential that had no nowhere to, to put it. Oh, that's that is so moving and and lovely to take this brick mm-hmm. of Mary Sims's story and mm-hmm. to say, I put your name on it, I put it out there publicly and I I show the humanity, I show the potential, I show the I show what she did and and also the the fulfillment of that potential by standing up in court and taking her life in her own hands by saying what she said is such an extraordinary mm-hmm. thing. Did it make a difference to you to work with a showrunner who truly could represent that in her bones? Was it a collaboration? It was a collaboration for sure, for sure. Um, because like, yeah, like we said, there, there wasn't much um, like in textbooks or books anywhere about Mary Sims really. So it was like us working together to figure out, you know, what life would have looked like for her. And um, I remember one of the scenes um, we did talk, we uh, we talked about when I went, ran away from Sorry, am I supposed to be? Well, um, in one of the scenes, we talked about, like, I think it was your aunt, Monica. Was it your aunt? It was, yeah, it was a family member. Yeah, we ta- um, there was, like, a family member. So, like, there was, like, a lot of, like, putting in from our personal lives into this one character. And I do think that even though we don't have much information on the individual that is Mary, I do believe that because of um, slavery and because of all the oppression that like black women face, um, one black woman can tell you the story of a hundred black women, (laughs) you know, around the world that just because of literally how we physically present. So just, yeah, it was just a whole bunch of, of, of that going on. And it was, it was really nice to have Monica like find out so much, uh, even though it wasn't like a lot, it was like a good amount of, of, of information on Mary to kind of work on. Hello, Guilty Feminists. This is Deborah. We're back at King's Place in London recording more live episodes. On the 24th of March, my co-host will be the incredible Abigail Shimon, and guests include journalist and presenter India Rackerson and poet Amy Aker. Then on the 27th of March, we have the first of our Guilty Feminist book clubs, where we will be talking to Susie Miller, who wrote the hit play with Jodie Comer, Prima Facie. She has now turned that play into a novel. And we are looking at it alongside feminist classic from the 70s, Fear of Flying by Erica Jong. We're going to do more of these throughout the year, so please do join us at our very, very first Guilty Feminist Waterstones book club. And we're back at King's Place on the 10th of April before heading off to Australia and New Zealand, where we will be appearing live and recording an episode in Christchurch on the 11th of May, Auckland on the 14th of May, Wellington on the 15th of May, Adelaide on the 18th of May, Perth on the 20th, Sydney on the 23rd, Melbourne on the 25th, Brisbane on the 27th, and finally Canberra on the 28th of May. So get in and get your tickets now. They are going very fast. Please go to guiltyfeminist.com and just click on live shows for any of these events. One of the Guilty Feminist's favourite co-hosts is Alison Spittle, and she has some tour dates. Some of them got shifted. So if you want to see her do her live, brilliant stand-up show, she is coming to Hull on the 16th of March, Newcastle on the 17th, Soho Theatre in London on the 20th to the 23rd of March, Oxford on the 24th, Luton on the 28th, New Milton on the 29th, and her tour continues around the country in April and May. For details, go to ctickets.com and search for Alison Spittle. 
Thank you so much for everyone who supports us via Patreon. From as little as £2.50 a month, you get ad-free episodes and you can be the first to know when tickets go on sale or when we have other special offers, opportunities or news. And if you're passing Apple Podcasts or Spotify and you felt like leaving us a five-star review, that really does help other people find the podcast. Um, You can leave it for any individual episode you've enjoyed or just in general. You could also tell someone you know with your face or drop it into a WhatsApp group that you think they would really enjoy The Guilty Feminist. That's all from me. And now back to the podcast. I didn't know how much like uh, black Americans were out in the street mourning Lincoln because he represented for them somebody who would fight to Mm -hmm. end enslavement. Did you realise that before, how... Like, Monica, you were saying you didn't fully see that the assassination previously was so connected to the emancipation. Did you know how much Lincoln was, and maybe this is, maybe Americans do know this, uh, as a non-American, I didn't realise that black people were out in the street mourning him and how much they loved him. And of course I get it now that I'm starting to watch the show, but did you guys know this before? I definitely did because a lot of black families will have like a picture of him in their house or something like that. I didn't know that the thing about uh, how many black people were in the streets waiting to find out if he lived or died, that I learned from the book. And James Swanson, who's the author of uh, Manhunt, the book, on the one call that I had with him before we began, he said to me, this is the one thing that really matters to me most. And Besides that, he was very um, generous and sort of just letting me take my version of it and run with it. But he said that what was super important to him that he discovered in the research is that the night of the assassination, the streets were full of patrons from the theater and, you know, mostly white people, some black people. But by the morning, hours later, it was predominantly black people there uh, you know, waiting to see not just the fate of Lincoln, but their own fate. And and he found that very moving and so did I. Mm-hmm. So that was something that was really important for Carl Franklin, the director, and I to capture. It was one of the hardest scenes to film, actually, and I'm so proud of how it turned out. But the thing that Lovey was referring to earlier was I had a line in there about the, uh, Dr. Mudd kept kind of bothering her about the fact that she hadn't cleaned the mirrors. And I think Lovey was a little bit like, why the mirrors? Like, you know, she just wasn't quite connecting to it. And so I realized, oh, I picked that specifically because someone I was close to when I was small, who was a dark skinned black woman who was very close to me, she had to take a job with a rich family. And the last time I saw her, I asked her how she was doing. And she said, I'm okay, but this job is really hard. They make me clean the mirrors every day. It was just sort of like a detail that she told me of like how sort of nitpicky they were with her and how hard they were working with her. And unfortunately, she passed away. And that was the last conversation I ever had Mm -hmm. with her. And so I put that in the script to honor her because she was a domestic worker. And so even though that was in the 1980s, you know, her, her life was not a whole lot different than, than Mary Sims. And Mm -hmm. once I told that story to Lovey, she just completely dialed into it and she did such a beautiful job. Mm. And mirrors. Thank you. Mirrors is very hard to clean without smearing. So it's this constant, and also (laughs) it's so the white people can look at themselves and, but, but the horrible thing about having to clean a mirror, if you hate doing it and if it's never going to be good enough is you're watching yourself work. So there's so much poetry in in that story. Um, you're seeing the reflection of the constant, you know, battle of being made to do stuff that you you shouldn't have to be doing and don't want to do. And as you say, you know, you're pouring all of these different black women stories, and that you know, love is carrying while playing this character. It's very very poignant. How important do you think it is? Because you're really setting up the stakes in the first couple of episodes. And how how important do you think it was that they do find the assassin of Lincoln? Like it feels like there's this massive stakes on it. Why was it so important? Because at one point someone says, let the coward run off. We'll continue. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Let the coward run off. Why was it so important? I think it's important because with every movement, or not with every movement, but with certain movements, the ones that have a poster child, like a face for the movement, 
those are the ones that kind of take off really fast. And those are the ones that get a lot of hatred really fast. So if you think about like MLK, Malcolm X, even Jesus, you know what I mean? Those people, they believed in something Mm -hmm. and it kind of, it got, it made a sense of community, but it also kind of, you know, did the other end, the violent end of it. So I do think that when you become a face of a movement, um, (laughs) that's a lot of responsibility. And it's like, you symbolize hope to a wide group and variety of people. So for Mm -hmm. a group of people to see John Wilkes Booth caught and for other people that might have believed in him to say, oh, I can get caught for something like this. It kind of instills a fear or it instills something different in society that's going to affect how people maneuver. So like when um, Lincoln became president, like all of the black people that were there, like um, when Monica was saying, like, I did know that a lot of black people were there because Lincoln was the face of hope because of what he believed in at the time. So if there's a face for it, there's going to be a lot of action around it. So I do think that that's why it was so important that that symbol for, you know, anti everything that Lincoln was for be, you know, corrected, brought in and to justice. Mm, yes. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, in recent times, a lot of scholars have been looking at Lincoln and, and pointing out that, you know, he wasn't completely evolved on all aspects of, of abolition and anti-slavery from the beginning. He had a journey with that. And I do show a piece of that and his relationship with Frederick Douglass, who was really campaigning um, for emancipation and for for more rights. And so he, you know, he was he was definitely flawed, but he definitely was so courageous in putting his life on the line Mm -hmm. uh, the way he did. I did want to say that you stole my um, guilty feminist joke. Lovey Deb does this thing. I'm a feminist, but... And I was going to say, I'm a feminist, <laughs> but I, I wrote a show about a lot of it. <laughs> <Literally. laughs> um, and there's reasons, there's reasons for that, you know, mm-hmm. um, institutional reasons of, you know, why I sort of, after many years, wanted to get something actually made. But I was so happy that in doing so, I was able to uh, tell Mary's story amidst mm-hmm. that. Um, yeah. You know, and I mean, I, 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 I like that saying, but I honestly feel like to like, you know, you making the show about this men in this, this assassination, I do think it is a bit of um, radical feminism only because feminism at its core is not to erase anything, you know, it's to kind of bring awareness to the, this and the, that that's going on. You know what I mean? So the fact that like, Mm -hmm. there's this story about this assassination and we think it's about this one guy, but it was about this guy and this guy and this woman and this woman that talked to this guy, you know? So it's like, it's really about like the human story around this one man. So Mm -hmm. if anything, I do think it's a, it's a bit, it's a bit feminist. feminist. I think it's a, I think it's a great Trojan horse (laughs) for feminism because if you do a show about emancipation and about black women being emancipated from Mm -hmm. enslavement, you know, who's going to watch that? A very small (laughs) group of people who already agree with you. If you do a show called Mm -hmm. Manhunt and it's got actors uh, like Tobias Menzies and Anthony Boyle on horseback, riding yeah. around chasing each other with guns. <laughs> the very people who, you know, may see themselves as American patriots or want to watch kind of men chasing each other with guns and horses will watch that with an open chest. And then, yeah. you know what, lots can get in when people open their chest. So I feel this right. is a Trojan horse, a brown mm-hmm. Trojan horse with a star on its forehead that uh that's a relevant detail from the show, uh, that says, hey, come on this ride, this adventure, this boy's own adventure of, you know, it's called Manhunt. It's a safe for all the men who might otherwise never watch anything that sounds feminist. But actually it really makes you Mm -hmm. rethink about how people were living, what Mm -hmm. attitudes were like, and how we're not actually that very, we're not actually very far from that. Um, yeah. and what changed the day that Lincoln got shot? What could have been different if Lincoln hadn't been shot? And the women in his life, the women in Edwin Stanton, who was the man hunter who went after the killer of his friend and 
and mm-hmm. uh, the killer of the the attempted kill, assassin of the ideals that Lincoln stood for. So there are other women in this as well, and I think it will shift more views than it would if the story was called Mary Sims. Mm-hmm. But good Lord, you're doing a great job, Lovey, at holding that torch Thank bright you. in the middle. It's really wonderful. Is, Thank you. <laughs> what would you like to tell the listeners of The Guilty Feminist that may not otherwise have necessarily watched a show called Manhunt? What do you want to tell them about why they should watch this show, what they're going to get from this show? I'm trying not to give a lot of spoilers, but uh, why do you want them to come and what do you want them to take away from it? You know, some people have been saying that Lincoln is like everyone's dad's or uncle's favorite subject. And I really feel that there's a lot of this show that will appeal to sort of non-bros, non-dads, um, and non-history buffs. It's mm-hmm. it's really uh, what I'm trying to do is present a true crime story that just happens to be in the past. And so if you love true crime, if you love mysteries, um, I would love for you to see the show. If you love literary fiction, you know, I was able to do so much depth and richness with these characters because of the amount of time I was given and uh, resources. So if you really love character-based stories, this Mm -hmm. is for you. And I would say um, the women involved in the story, uh, besides Mary Sims, like Mary Todd Lincoln, played by Lily Taylor, and her dressmaker, Elizabeth Keckley, played by Betty Gabriel, were characters who aren't really in the book and who were really important for me to show that Lincoln had two women very close in his inner circle, that the stereotype of Mary Todd Lincoln being quote unquote, you know, crazy, mentally ill. I refute that and say, no, she was someone dealing with trauma before psychology Mm -hmm. and that he was such a brilliant man. She had to have been so brilliant for him to have kept by his side and his counsel on many things. And then the character of Elizabeth Keckley, I think very few people know about her. I was excited to see Sarah Jessica Parker um, did an homage to her at the Met Gala, I think last year. Um, But she was a trailblazing Black American fashion designer. And Mary Lincoln um, hired her to be her personal dresser and, and gown designer. And she was sort of at the forefront of designing gowns that were more flattering and more custom fit for women. And I can imagine, because I'm very short, um, that Mary Todd Lincoln to find things that, you know, fit her well was probably, you know, hard. But they became very close friends. And Elizabeth Keckley wrote an autobiography. And in it are some scenes behind the curtains of the Lincoln White House that we would not know about had she not documented. Mm. Um I think she's a fascinating character. I was so happy to get her into the story and also to show how she and the Lincolns, um, she basically started a charity for freed people um, that helped people get on their feet because the government wasn't helping to do that. So I thought that was really fascinating because a lot of times there's a real um, bias or shame sometimes about like, people in poverty, well, why don't you help yourselves, you know? And she was really proactive in doing that. And then the Lincolns supported her. So that was exciting for me. And of course, Mary Sims, Lovey, you know, one thing we've noticed is that we have more information about Booth's horse in the research than we do about Mary Sims. Oh my God. Which is really awful and telling. And so the opportunity to bring her to life and to have her in the collective conscious as a figure, you know, who was so important that almost no one knows about, that was huge to me. And I think your listeners will appreciate her story. Are you implying that a woman and a black woman at that has been written out of history? Extraordinary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? Hard to imagine. We know more about his horse. We're waiting, we're waiting oh, her back in. It's <laughs> shocking. Shocking. I love everything you've said, Monica, and, and I think it's true. It's a costume drama. Listen, let's not put too fine a point on it. There are some handsome men in breeches riding horses. Um, let's let's be honest. Uh, but also, it has got that wonderful true crime feel. <laughs> the end of episode two is so exciting. You're like, oh, my God. Uh, and I think that that is it's, it is entertaining. 
It is not trauma porn. You're not going to be like, I can't watch this and now I have to put my hands off my eyes for that. It's not like that at all. It's really compelling and it's a really gripping, entertaining story throughout which you will learn a lot about American history, but told through a different lens than you would normally be told it. Lovey, what is it that you think you want to draw people in with and what do you want people to take away from it? Something I was thinking about was I really appreciate in this show, and this is for the Guilty Feminist listeners too, I appreciate how the women in this in, in Manhunt, they are naturally, I think, like really feminine. I feel like they're very in tune with their feminine energy. I feel like they're very intuitive. I feel like they're very caring and maternal mm-hmm. and um, like Mary, both Marys and, and everybody. Um, even, even the mother of, you know, the conspirators, I feel like, you know, it was a lot of feminine energy, Mm. but I do think with their natural feminine energies in the journey that is manhunt, there is a lot of masculine approaches that these feminine women have to like go through. Like they have to throw in a lot of logic and a lot of, you know, a lot more of that masculine kind of strength, you know, those like suits or whatever. And then I do feel like with, for the men, they are very masculine. And I do think that <laughs> during this manhunt, they all ha- individually like have to go through a very feminine like approach to kind of get through their storyline. So they have to maybe tap more into their intuition or become a little softer or kind of, you know, lean more into whatever. So just seeing the the balance of the masculine and the feminine feminine energies in manhunt is very intriguing. And as to what Monica said, I do, as a brown girl myself, I don't like seeing or being traumatized by, um, you know, you know, uh, films about slavery or anything regarding slavery. So just as a viewer, it's really nice to not see that seeing pain is necessary to tell the story. Um, rather than like seeing courage being built up and then actually like um, having a moment where you like transform yourself, um, even if it's in like a small way that changes everything in a big way. So I think viewers will appreciate that too. Yes, me too. Monica, is there anything you came to say that you didn't get to say about Manhunt? Is there anything you want to tell us about the story? And I I want I also want this very quickly before you answer that, the listeners to know that um, – Monica refers to the book it's based on. It's a nonfiction book. It's a deep and wonderful resource, very well written, but she had to turn it into a story and into a drama. It wasn't like adapting a novel, which even that is very difficult. It was completely using that as source material, and it really is her story, her creation. She is in every sense the the showrunner and the inventive mind behind this. Is there anything you want us to know about it or want us to know about the original story? Uh, I think we've covered a lot of it, but I would just say, um, you know, I think one of the things that is exciting for me in terms of the women in the story is when they're head to head with the men, those scenes for me were about how can women win these arguments or get what they want within the sort of maze and obstacles that are presented to them at the time. So later in an episode, there's an argument between Mary Todd Lincoln and, and Lincoln, and it's a family argument about their son. So I was using that as a chance to show, well, what were the boundaries and what were the ways that Mary Todd Lincoln could um, work with what she had or what she was, the power that she was able to have to to get what she felt was important. And same with Lovey's character. She has an amazing scene with Tobias in a later episode where he needs something from her. And she really has the power in that scene. And to see how she uses that power in a position where she's mostly powerless, mm-hmm. those scenes were really exciting to me. And I'm hoping that Um, like you said, people will come to the show because it's a thriller and because it's, you know, Mm -hmm. sexy people in period costumes, but, you know, we'll, we'll take from it, uh, much more than that. Yeah. There is some, I I love that fashion designer character that you uncovered. (laughs) How extraordinary that there was this amazing, 
a black female fashion designer that w- was right there in the household being, you know, creating designs for Mary Todd Lincoln and interacting and uh, I loved her. I didn't realise that she was, I mean, I figured she probably was a real character because you'd written her in, but I was like, wow, that seems very modern. But the past when you dig in often does. It was it was modern in its time. It was, you know, every mm-hmm. yes. every time is modern. Yeah. And I think it's been deliberately washed from things like that you know I think it's deliberate that we mm-hmm. don't know some of the things and so I I know for myself not knowing much about my family I thought I came from a really ordinary family like and when I did my genealogy I, I found I have a great uncle who was a one of the first black uh union soldiers who fought in the battle that's portrayed in glory and I think sometimes as black people, we feel like we're being told you don't you don't 100 percent belong here. You're not 100 percent American. Your history is on the side, you know, and I think one of the things that was important to me in doing this show was to show the Mary Sims and these other characters. We've been here for a long time and we were a, always a part of this story. It's just been a race. Mm. Mm-hmm. I was just reading in research for something else about a a play that was put on in America, I guess on Broadway in the, just after the Second World War and it came to the West End and it was about a black American soldier who'd gone and fought in the Second World War and then come back to his hometown, I guess, injured. And there was this, this controversy. He wanted to take out a library book and they were not wanting him to go into the library or take out a library book. And I'm like, oh, my God. And he was just like, I've just gone and fought for my country. And it was it came to the West End. And I'm like, this is ongoing and ongoing and ongoing and ongoing. Exactly what you're saying. It's like you're on the side. And it's like, no, 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 no. We're in the center. And I think this I show- actually have done research on that for another project. And I didn't know this, but black people were not allowed to take books out of libraries for a long time. You and and poor people, you poor people in general, you were not able to be in a library, take out books in a library, and unless you could essentially have a subscription to the library wow. and mm-hmm. and have a certain social status. But also, I think just small things that people don't know, like when I was working on the show, I had many people uh, who read the scripts question me about having such a presence of black soldiers they thought it was sort of over exaggerated. And I said, there were 200,000 black union soldiers. And I think a lot of times when we see war movies or novels, it's all white soldiers Mm -hmm. and people really think it was this battle completely done by white men. And everyone was shocked when I told them that. And they said, oh, okay, go ahead, you know. But it was something like that that, you know, just wasn't common knowledge and it was no one's fault. It's just not something that is really impressed upon us Mm -hmm. as, you know, we're learning things. Well, I think it was someone's fault, uh, but maybe that someone wasn't on set. And But I do think you had such an amazing trump card the whole time that you you studied African-American history at Harvard so anyone coming in and telling you this is not accurate, it's like, mm, sorry, but <laughs> it's highly accurate. Lovey, is there anything that you would like to say you didn't get to say? No pressure. I just always like to ask yeah, that. No, I Sometimes think, people go, yeah. I didn't get to say my favorite thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, yeah, I, I think I said uh, everything I, I wanted to say so far. <laughs> I will say one yeah, more thing for- about Lovey, which is that, you know, before this role, Lovey has really um, succeeded at playing roles where uh, the woman is very assertive, very um, not alpha, but like you know, very confident, a lot of self-esteem, knows what she wants, goes after what she wants, you know. And so yeah. I think this role is such a departure for her. And it was so incredible to see her transform because you know, a sort of submissive role where she doesn't have a lot of power and she has to navigate through obstacles of, of the time. Mm -hmm. It's just not something that, you know, it is, is something that she's really done before. And I really could not imagine another actress in the role. I just think she is beyond my dreams of what she's done with this. I just think she's completely transformed herself and, her range is astonishing. So I'm just 
so grateful. She took a gamble on me. I've never done a sh- you know, made my own show before, and I just can't wait for people to see her performance. Thank you, Monica. <laughs> And I can't wait for everyone to see your brilliant writing and uh, creative producing, Monica, as well. It's a real epic and you've put together something that's magnificent and it's no mean feat either. Uh, You've written all the episodes yourself and it's got scale. It's got a really epic quality, hasn't it, Lovey? Yes, it does. Even like um, I I was actually thinking about just like the show and even if it's not like a period piece, it's like I do feel like it's one of those shows that you can just kind of throw on. Even if you're, even if you've watched all the episodes two times, you can just put it on just strictly for like the colors and the lighting and the, you know, the faces and just all of that. I feel like works together so well. Like even if it were a silent film, that's what I was saying. Like I really wish that there was an alternate universe where I can watch this as a silent film just to kind of see just the energy between each of the characters and just to kind of see like what each room feels like, because I feel like every room on that set was like a body of its own, you know, and it served a different like purpose and you kind of felt it going into like the courtroom versus like Mud's um, office versus like um, Mary Sims, like new. So everything is just kind of like its own life, which felt really, 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 really good. Yeah. The locations are absolutely wonderful. I absolutely know what you mean. I love the titles. They're gorgeous. They're glorious. But I will say the reason I'm glad it's not a silent film is so that we get to hear all of Monica's snappy, brilliant, and poignant uh, subtextual dialogue. <laughs> Our production designer um, was a woman, which is small percentage of production designers are women. And Chloe Arbiter, she designed over 200 sets for the show. And I think she's absolutely incredible. Um, I really wanted to make something very cinematic so that, like what Lovey's saying, that that there's a visual story to it. And I tried to hire, uh, I did hire many women behind the scenes. Our first AD is a woman. Our visual effects supervisor is a woman. I have a woman editor. So, you know, it was a great opportunity. When you're a showrunner, one of the best things about it is being able to give really talented people great jobs. And um, so the collaboration was, you know, very fulfilling. I can tell that. There's no detail lost on it. It's gorgeous from top to bottom. And I'm very excited to see uh, how the story unfolds, the the true crime of it all. Uh, But also I've already found it deeply, deeply moving and and funny, surprisingly funny. Um, Monica and Lovey, thank you so much for joining me. Manhunt will be streaming on Apple TV+. Plus with the first two episodes available on the 15th of March and then new episodes every Friday. So you can watch the first two together. If you haven't got Apple TV, this would be a good time to get your free trial. You really, really need to see this show. You're going to learn so much about American history that is so relevant for today and how, you know, how how gun violence came off the battlefield and into the public spaces. It's an extraordinary thing, but also about how they've always been people willing to stand up and fight for what's right. And and that will give you hope. Great, great hope. Uh, it colours in, in very vivid coloured pencils, all sorts of erasure of the black women in these stories fighting the good fight and other women as well who were there present, but their stories aren't told. So we really, really do hope that you can tune in 15th of March and then new episodes every Friday. Personally, I can't wait. Thank you so much, Monica. And thank you so much, Lovey. Thank Thank you, Deb. The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.